morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to the fifth annual Caring Fest. My name is Grant Scott. I have the good fortune to live on Hornby Island and be the chairperson of uh, Conservancy Hornby Island. This is the first time we've ever done this virtually. Uh, so it's very interesting. It, uh, we've been able to reach out to more people, but it's very different than when we did it in the hall on Hornby Island. So I'm going to start by acknowledging that Hornby Island is in the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and specifically in, in the uh, homeland of the Comox First Nation. I'd like to acknowledge all the people that, that brought this event together. Uh, I'd like to thank the CHI board members who work all year round. I'd like to thank the speakers particularly who uh, put together some pretty amazing uh, events. The participants, you out there for, for signing into this on your Saturday morning. I'd specifically like to thank Judith Lawrence and the puppets from uh, Mr. Dress Up for them, uh, Casey and Finnegan for coming out on the boat and having uh, make creating an amazing little video with me. I was, it was a real highlight for me. And I also like to thank our friend Bob Turner from Bowen Island, who uh, whose video you'll see later on called Herring Fishery 2020. So I'd like to just start by saying that um, Conservancy Hornby Island. Um, one of the big events we do, of course, is the Herring Fest every year, but we also do things throughout the year. We bring speakers to the island. We've had speakers everywhere uh, speaking, speaking on everything from whales to vultures, birds, bats, bees. We do a beach cleanup every year. A couple of them with uh, Dan Island, just to uh, plastics in the ocean, dealing with that. Rebecca, uh, our who's organized all this from the background. You don't see her, but she's the one to put all this together. She's also, she's organizing, coordinating the Trees for Tomorrow project for us, which is a climate change initiative. We planted, she planted 10,000 trees on, on Hornby and Galliano Islands last year. Uh, and uh, she's, uh, we're gonna do another 10,000 this year on uh, Denman um, and a number of other Gulf Islands. Gabriola's interested, Pender, and uh, and Hornby, of course, we have. Uh, we want to thank all the artists that contributed to the Thursday night opening event. Uh, uh, the artwork is is will be on the web, uh, so that you can see it and you can buy the pieces from March till March thirty first. Want to say that fifty percent to one hundred percent go to Conservancy Island, Hornby Island's herring campaign. Some, some artists are kindly donating all of the proceeds, others uh, 50%. So we'd like to thank Hayak, Hornby Island Arts Council, Rochelle Chinnery for their hard work in putting this together. And, and we wanna especially thanks the Pacific Salmon Foundation for their financial assistance. And also we wanna uh, thank the donation donors for people like you out there that have helped CHI Conservancy Hornby Island do all these things through the year. So thank you very much for that. And of course, if you can, uh, however you can do it, if you can, uh, uh, further donations would be more than welcome at conservancyhornbyisland.org. Uh, you can go to Facebook and you can see the Casey and Finnegan first boat ride, uh, five minute video. Uh, there's the Silver of the Sea there by Ecologist, and there's Bob Turner's uh, Parent Fishery 2020. Uh, video, which we'll, we played last night, we'll also be playing again uh, af after this event today. Now, we, we didn't do the virtual boat trip as we've done other years, obviously for COVID, we just can't put people on the boat like that. Uh, Bob Turner's and uh, the puppets really, I, we think, capture a lot of what is to be seen out there. But just to bring you up to speed for what's going on this year, we're going to be doing a kind of uh, continual uh, boat tour. Every day we're gonna be going out when the weather permits, uh, at when the fishery's on, we're gonna go out and capture these amazing videographers we, we have are gonna go out and uh, film what's going on out there uh, around Hornby and Denman Islands. The boats are cruising around right now looking for fish. The, the herring are moving into the shallow waters now. There's birds out there. I can see them out my front room window here. So the excitement is building and uh, we'll be updating you that uh, every evening uh, with video clips that'll go out. And 
I'm not exactly sure we're going to email you exactly. You, the people that are on our list that have signed up will be emailed and get the, uh, this information every day. We've got more uh, very interesting speakers lined up. We have Chief Ernest Alford. We have Alex, Alexandra Morton. We have Dr. John Nielsen and Bob Raisley there with us now, and they will be coming on soon um, with their presentations. And after this is over, uh, we encourage you to stay tuned. There'll be uh, after we have a, a panel discussion with these, these four people. And then after that, we have another panel discussion, larger one with all the people, the uh, presenters last night, plus Gore Johns, our member of parliament, who'd been very active. Uh, in promoting hearing issues in the House of Commons. He's gone and talked to the minister many times. So uh, he's very supportive. He's going to be on. So there's going to be a very interesting panel discussion. Uh, you can phone in with your questions on the Q&A on the bottom of your screen there. Put your questions up on there and we'll bring them up and, and ask these, these, uh, very, uh, these people that we have on the panel uh, for their answers. Uh, so we hope, and then after this, as I said, uh, stay tuned. There'll be three short films at the end of it, Respect for All Things uh, by the Hearing Protectors from Sitka Sound, Alaska. There, you'll be able to see the Casey and Finnegan first boat ride, and there'll be the Herring Fishery by Bob Turner. So now uh, we'd like to turn this over to our guests, and thank you all for participating. Our first speakers this evening are Chief Ernest Alfred and Alex, Alexander Morton, who together have been instrumental in closing down the fish farms up in the Broughton Archipelago on the north end of Vancouver Island. And the purpose of that was to protect the herring and the salmon stocks, the wild stocks that move through that area, that live in that area, and the ones that migrate through there to come down in, into the Salish Sea. So we're hoping to learn from, from their valuable experience. So we want to welcome Chief Alfred and Alex to our webinar. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kwakwabalas. My traditional name is Kwakwabalas. Uh, my English name is Ernest Alfred. And I represent uh, several nations here on the North Island. Um, the Mamalilkala, the Klawitis, but my Indian status card uh, says uh, Namki's First Nation. And I'm also a, an, an elected member of council for the Namkis, um, but I'm also a, a school teacher, uh, an elementary school teacher where I run the cultural program at Alert Bay School. And uh, I am in fact in the unceded territory of the Namki's First Nation and want to acknowledge all of the uh, first people who are tuning in and especially those that are uh, stepping up and hearing the call to protect what is uh, our natural resources. So um, <clears throat> I want to give you some little bit of history about who I am and that started here in Alert Bay. I've always lived here. Uh, this is where my family's from and we've called this place home for thousands of years. Um, I grew up on a, on a fishing boat, a seine vessel, a beautiful boat called the W11, and, uh, and, and spent a lot of time on my, dad, on my dad's boat. And there, my, my father uh, employed uh, several family members, and it was a family business that we were very proud of. And uh, it, it broke my heart uh, when the W11 sunk uh, at the uh, pier at the marina here in Alert Bay. And, um, and that was because it, 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 uh, it was taken away. I, I, we, we basically had no, no other choice but to sell that, uh, that boat. And that came after the decision to implement the Mifflin plan. And uh, my dad sold his license and uh, later sold the boat uh, because it was just too expensive. And uh, the last year we went fishing, I think it was 94. Uh, we we actually had something like twelve hours, uh, twelve hours of fishing that entire season, and so um, it, DFO basically made it impossible for the fishermen to continue here in Alert Bay. My father 
uh, then effectively had to uh, uh, fire uh, those family members. And so, so it wasn't just our family that was negatively impacted by that decision, but it also had a, a massive, massive impact on our community. And we've not been the same since. Um, which is be before my time, Alert Bay was a thriving community uh, built on the backs of our salmon, the fish scales and the blood of, of, of salmon. And um, even the old people um, were famously quoted saying that the Namkis um, in this area were the first to actually have and obtain cash and money. And that was because of the, the Nimkish River, which you know has always provided for our people. And, um, and so I, I wanted to reflect a little bit about you know, who, who I am and the reason why I fight so bloody hard. Um, when we say that we fight um, for our children and our, for our grandchildren, um, I, want to, I want to talk a little bit about what that means for me. And what that meant was um, getting completely fed up with the fish farm industry and the threats uh, that 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 whole fishery, that whole operation um, posed on our not only our people but our way of life, our food security, and our right to say we don't want that. And um, as far back as I could remember, um, our our communities have have um, fought that industry, the fish farm industry, that open net pens, and the like. I say I'm, I'm not that old, but I do remember um, being very young and going on my grandfather's boat, the Scalu, also now sitting in the, in the graveyard of uh, our beaches here, uh, and, and going to the, the, the fish farms uh, in the Broughton Archipelago to protest. And so really, as, as far back as I could remember, we've always sort of um, have fought and opposed this open net pen um, fish farm industry. And so the really, the big breaking point came to me in, uh, for myself personally, came to me in uh, the summer of 2016, when I phoned my, our sister Kwayumzi, Alexandra Morton, and I said, I need to, I need to get involved. I need to do something. What can I do? And she invited me aboard the Martin Sheen. And she said that she wanted to turn uh, the ship, which was then under uh, her sort of um, her uh, control and she she wanted to give it to the First Nations people. And so I went for a ride and I, I went out to the fish farms and had a really, for the first time, had a really close look. And I was shocked, you know, and, and that was enough to wake and sh jolt me and shake me and and realizing that I'm, I'm actually a, a forest person and, and a whale person and I thought to myself, my gosh, if, if, if we're gonna do anything about our, our Northern residents, if we're gonna do anything about the Southern residents, their, foods, their food security, that whole, that whole issue needs to be addressed. And when you take a look at these fish farms and you really take a close look, it's not just Atlantic salmon in there, there's juvenile cod, there's all kinds of um, life forms within, that, within those pens, including wild salmon, ooligan, and Pacific herring, and when we saw that, I, I I was I was floored and shocked because there was always this narrative and this talk about all of the all of the disease and pathogens that are flowing outside the pens, and then sitting you know and and entering our environment, but not too much consideration and really, and it wasn't until that that summer that we really had a good look at what was coming in. And so, um, and, and Chief George Quark's sister, uh, when he stepped out to the farm, he was, he was almost um, uh, floored with the thousands of tons of herring that were within these pens. And uh, so the following summer, uh, 2017, um, we'd had enough. You know, I, I, was, I was driven um, and tired of the meetings and negotiations and you know, we, we were just becoming used to complaining about not having any fish. And it seemed to me that no negotiations with the government, uh, no relationship with this industry was gonna change any of that. And what that meant was putting ourselves right on the front line, going out to Swanson Island fish farm and staying there and parking there. 
And um, we, I, we joke about it now with my family about how we thought we were going to get an, an immediate reaction and, and maybe Ernest was going to go out and do this protest and it was going to last a couple of weeks and nobody really knew. Nobody really knew. We didn't know what, we're, what, was, uh, what we were getting ourselves into, but we stayed. And we stayed there for 284 days. And it wasn't until um, the company secured a, an injunction. <laughs> we were taken to court a couple of times uh, by Marine Harvest. But um, it wasn't until then that we, we decided we, we had to leave and, and that um, the entire time we were instructed uh, and under the care and, uh, and with the support of the hereditary chiefs who own this, these places. And we were told that we had to uh, conduct ourselves in a respectful manner. And we were told how to, how to behave. And uh, I think that was, uh, that was successful in, in, terms of, um, in terms of how long it took uh, the industry to actually secure that in, injunction because we actually weren't doing anything. <laughs> we were watching and we were taking their photos. And, um, and thank goodness we had support from um, all over the place, including uh, the international community because it turns out Scotland, Ireland, and um, Tasmania, all, all these places all over the world are struggling with this very industry. And uh, we were really muscled. We were really mistreated over during that time. And um, so I appreciate the opportunity to sort of touch on, on that because, and, and reflect a little bit about why um, I was invited to speak. And, and join you today. So I'm really thankful for this opportunity and, and want to acknowledge uh, the good people that are at Conservancy Hor Hornby there and, and organizing this year after year because I think it's really important that we celebrate, you know, and, and acknowledge the, the life that the ocean provides. You know, we, we've, um, we, we often talk about the um, Indigenous reconciliation and we often talk about um, respecting First Nations and uh, respecting the environment and, and the fear that we have around um, the climate crisis that we're, we're in right now. And uh, especially recently with the pandemic, it, it, it's really clear that we, we, we need to take a better, better look at what we're doing uh, with our environment and we, we need to do a better job. And uh, it really, it really hits um, home to me, the whole uh, herring, uh, Pacific herring and the threat that uh, they face. Um, because I, again, I was, I was a fish, my, my father was a fisherman and every, every spring he was out um, providing for our family on a, on a herring boat. And that was a family business also. And, and, and lots of people here um, made a lot of money. And so that's, those days are gone. You know, um, my uncle calls um, these these uh, these license holders armchair fishermen because um, all of these sort of licenses aren't even in, in the hands of um, of our people anymore. And uh, so we have to really talk about the mismanagement of DFO, and it's it's just been pretty pretty obvious to those of us who have been uh, fighting the fish farms that. DFO is in, in, incredibly incapable of uh, managing this resource. And it was through, you know, our sort of our push and our demand to have a voice at the table in this decision making process that they finally opened the door. They finally let us in and are finally paying attention and uh, and listening to our traditional knowledge. And, and what we see here on the ground is actually really viable and, 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 and quite um, valuable. And so when, um, when we talk about the Harry Knight, I'm, I'm a bit conflicted because I, I, do, I, do, I do remember what it was like when my father came home um, after a herring fishery. And um, it, it made, our, it made our, our, our childhood a little bit um, nice. We were, not, we were not broke people. We were wealthy people. And so, but what I worry about though, and this all ties in, and in, this is where we go wrong all the time. Modern society wants to put a fence up and, and say that the forest has nothing to do with the ocean or that the net pens don't affect um, 
um, life forms further downstream, it, it doesn't make sense. We actually, and this is why our area-based management really kind of scares me too, because our people never have that view. Our people have never looked at our environment in that in the in those sort of terms, and that our entire our entire view um, is that we're connected to these things, and that when we go and catch um, a, a fish, when we go and harvest cedar from a tree, or when we pick berries, we give thanks. And that's something I want to share with everybody because we need to reintroduce this to our children because we need to ask where our food comes from. I don't know of, of many families now that, and, and our young children, if I were to ask my students, uh, do you uh, question where your food comes from? Or do you give thanks at the dinner table and, quest and, and wonder who prepared that meal? And, 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 and where did that food come from? Because we have to change the way we think about our environment um, and, and think of it as a whole. And so when I stared into these pens and saw thousands and thousands of uh, tons of herring, again, George Quaxister could um, back, but he was, he was one uh, 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 skilled fisherman who understood what thousands of tons look like. I would never be able to quantify that at all, but he certainly did. And, and was able to really, really rattle um, my thought around, okay, what the heck is going on here? Effectively, these farmers are running a fish, uh, uh, a herring fishery, moving herring around the territory. You know, in the Broughton Archipelago for 30 years, we've, been, we've not been able to touch any herring whatsoever. If I, went, if I went and caught some herring and put it into a net or, or tried to take it home, I'd probably be charged under the Fisheries Act. So then I ask, what the heck are these fish, uh, fish farmers doing within these pens. And uh, so then one has to also ask, you know, what are they doing once, once the, the herring fishermen bring their catch and they bring it to shore, what happens to that herring? And the fact that a massive majority of these, this herring has been ground up and been fed back to the aquaculture industry in, in the form of pellets uh, and fish feed. So, uh, that to me really breaks my heart. It, it breaks my heart because it's no longer food and, and we, we no longer view this as, as, uh, uh, as a life form and, and, a, and, um, and a, a, a keystone species for our, for our environment here. Um, management um, looks, looks at this as, as a resource. I mean, we had herring fishermen shooting at, at, at sea lines, for God's sakes, because, this, this, um, because of this fishery. And, and so I really want to question everybody and, and, and really think to challenge everybody to think about exactly how, how we treat our environment. And, and the fact that there is no barriers here. When we start talking about the herring fishery, when we start talking about uh, the aquaculture industry, the forestry industry, all of the tourism industry, all of these things are all super intertwined. And, and, and I, I dislike and, and disagree with anybody that says otherwise. And so <clears throat> I, um, I, talk about, I talk about these things uh, with a lot of passion. And the reason for that is because we did put our lives on the line and it was, we had lots of support from all over the world, um, but it was really the local, uh, mostly young women who uh, who held our ground for 284 days and said that you know this this has to be this has to stop and so what's come out of that and to provide you with a little bit of a, a, a back uh, an update is uh, the fish farms are now in retreat and um, you can go ahead and clap uh, because uh, because of the commitment of the First Nations people up and down the coast, but, but more, more so those, uh, those important allies and the people that stood behind us, <clears throat> environmental groups, conservation organizations, the massive uh, scientific community, but First Nations up and down the coast were, were, were showing up and, 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 and lending their support. And um, that to me gives me a lot of hope because in the Broughton Archipelago, um, we, we see the, uh, I think it's seven, out of the 11 farms that are, are, um, are in retreat, seven are now decommissioned and, and are no longer present in our territory. Uh, this is really exciting. Um, 
because when we go into these places, we you we're already hearing reports um, from people who are on the ground. It's it's like my cousins who go clam digging, uh, my relatives who go up and down the inlet uh, every day because that's where they live, um, and already seeing the positive impact of 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 the removal of those farms. And uh, now uh, we see the the Discovery Island um, decision last December. Um, has, has, has also uh, effectively done the same thing. And so what we've done is we prioritized farms in the Broughton to clear a path of the, the migration route for the salmon that, uh, that go and, and spawn in the Broughton archipelago. This is important to the Numbris. Our territory borders don't actually uh, extend too far into the Broughton. Uh, and, and in fact, ends at, at Swanson Island. But our, it, it, it's no secret that our salmon are, are leaving the Nimkish River, our salmon, the Namkis fish, leave our river and use the Broughton as a nursery and grow up there. And, 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 um, and that, that, that evidence is there. And so I'm excited because uh, what this meant was, was that all of, the, all of the Broughton nations got together, sat down and said, we're, we, we're gonna blur these lines a little bit for the sake of saving our fish. And, and, and now, we, we see we see the result and it's that these these fish farms have to go uh, it, it, it is in total contradiction to our our, our, our world view on our environment and and you know what these guys are really the only people making a whole lot of money in our territory and uh, and the question you know then becomes to other first Nations um, to to step up and really question you know what sort of relationship do they want uh, with these in, in with this industry? The one that we protest, the one that we fought, the one that we, uh, um, the one that we absolutely want to see removed from the entire uh, BC coast, and so uh, it, this is a, an exciting time because now we can put the science to work. Our people are now on the ground. We we had to establish a, a new department. Uh, we had to hire a field crew. We had to establish an office. We had to buy boats. And, and so all of this is all under, all under currently underway. And our people are now boarding these farms, testing for sea lice, uh, taking a look at um, managing the rivers and, and, if, uh, and, and rehabilitation. And, and this is really exciting. And this is really the, the really, I was told by chief, my brother, um, Bob Chamberlain, that this would, the, the Broughton decision was the first time that uh, anywhere in Canada where the um, Declaration of Indigenous Rights, UNDRIP, was implemented and was the guiding uh, principles uh, to come to that, that decision. Really um, good work. And so I, I have, <clears throat> excuse me, I have, um, I have an issue with uh, DFO and I have problems with the elected officials that, uh, that, uh, that are making some of these decisions. But you, we really have to. We really have to take our hats off to the leadership, and and the vision, and the collaboration uh, that is required to protect our environment. And now more so than ever, is it important that we have that open dialogue with our governments? And 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 you really, I I I take. I have to take my hat off to the people sitting in in charge right now for the first time ever, feeling that. We have a, a different relationship with Victoria and Ottawa um, because everybody knows and everybody wants to uh, everybody wants to respect and reconcile with First Nations people. We're going to have to actually put the environment on the table now because our 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 people understand our relationship uh, with our environment and our resources, and um, we no longer can rely on the 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 uh, the abundance that once was of our in, in our of our oceans and even our beaches and so we we really we really have to put that um uh, as a priority especially um with the entire the entire uncertainty that uh that globally that we see with uh with the climate crisis and the fact that we our people are are relying on uh, government handouts and uh, have to go to the grocery store to buy food is, uh, is something we all really need to take a close look at. And so uh, I'm really excited. I, 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 I'm, um, 
I'm, I think that it's going to take a lot of pressure. And I only reflect a little bit about uh, what my relatives are doing up in Hiltzauk territory up in Bella Bella and how they've turned uh, that really terrible situation that they were in a few years ago uh, with the herring fishery and have turned that story around and that they are fully in charge of that, uh, that area and their resource, the, the, they call it Wane, uh, the herring. And really we should be modeling after them and follow their, follow their uh, example um, because there's a viable, viable fishery there, but it's, it's more importantly, they got their food security back. And that's what we really need to strive um, as first people. And um, I, 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 will, I will stand behind uh, and stand beside and support any nation, any leader that, uh, that takes a stand and says, no more, we can't, we can't continue to abuse our environment like this because we, we can do things in a better way. And, and that's where I get a lot of hope. And, um, and, it's, and, and that's why we fight and we fight hard. Uh, because uh, that's what it means. If we're if we're going to stand up for our children, we're going to stand up for our environment. We're going to uh, um, not put a dollar amount on on absolutely everything that comes out of the water. Um, that's what it's going to mean. And it, it, to me, that means um, sticking your neck out and and taking a couple of hits. Because um, I the way I see it is, yeah, it's worth it. So uh, I want to thank all of you for um, for paying attention to this because this is a really big issue for us. Um, we support any of the any of the nations that uh, that want to take a stand and and protect our environment, protect our oceans. We really need to change the way bus business as usual needs to change, and that nobody in an office uh, should be making decisions like this uh, without actually coming to talk to us first. And I'm and I and I'll die saying that. So I want to thank all of the organizers, the people, the good people there at Hornby Island for putting all of this together. And, and giving me the opportunity to really reflect a little bit about um, what, what brought me here and, and you know, what, what this means for the future of our people and, and our nation. And what that means is that we're not going away. <laughs> you know? and, and if you're gonna come and do business in our territory, you don't need to come and talk to us anymore. You actually need to get some permissions. So, um, and that's something all of these industries uh, needs, needs to come to terms with. And so um, I'm excited to uh, the work ahead and, and look forward to uh, any questions and, and, and you know, future dialogue and, uh, and, and look forward to visiting Hornby. Um, just one more note, we had a lot of support uh, from the islands um, in, in that neck of the woods, Denman Island, Salt Spring Island. And uh, we, it's too bad we're in the middle of a pandemic because um, I would definitely love to come and shake your hands and, and thank you for the work that you're doing uh, in person, but uh, we'll, keep, we'll, keep, uh, we'll keep the future and, and the bright future that we have uh, and all of those options open. Kila uh, Kesla, thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Chief Alfred, for your, um, for your very inspiring talk. And next we have Alexandra Morton, who's a, a well-known, she's a biologist, been working for the last 30, 40 years up in the area to protect uh, killer whales, as, as well as all the fish that are affected by the sea, uh, fish farms up there. So, uh, Alex, we're, we're very happy to have you on with us. She is an independent biologist who has published extensively on the impact of salmon farms on the BC coast. She founded the Remote Salmon Field Station and has been featured on 60 Minutes, gave TED Talks in Seattle in 2019, and now works as an advisor for several First Nations concerned about the collapse of salmon and herring in their territories. Alex, we're very pleased to have you again uh, on Hornby Island. She was here a number of years ago and packed the hall. She's a very effective speaker. Thanks for being with us, Alex. Hi, I'm very happy to be speaking to all of you at Herring Fest. Uh, of course, herring are incredibly important to this coast. I came to uh, British Columbia in 1984 uh, to the Broughton Archipelago to begin a long-term study on the orca. I wanted to model a study after Dr. Jane Goodall's work and just live in their environment and study them over decades. In particular, I was interested in their acoustics. 
they're a large brained animal living in the ocean, holding their breath, which is, uh, of course, brains require a lot of oxygen. And so for an animal that's holding its breath, to have such a large brain was an indicator that they were using all of it. And it seemed to me that their sounds were the way to access, perhaps, the intelligence that was uh, that occurred inside these brains. So I found the Broughton Archipelago, and it was the perfect place. It was so quiet. Uh, it was a tiny community of Echo Bay. It was very calm waters because of the uh, number of islands, and there weren't the big currents that you see in many parts of the coast. The herring, arrival of the herring in the spring was always anticipated. Uh, if I didn't anticipate it, I certainly knew about it very quickly as soon as the herring would move into the area because suddenly there was a, a showing of birds, there were eagles, um, it was, the sea lions showed up. It was a very dynamic event. So for somebody watching the environment and studying it, the arrival of the herring, although it was very hard to, of course, see them, you saw their whole contingent that went with them, all of their predators. We had herring of all sizes. Um, this obviously is a quite a large herring uh, being held by my friend Billy Proctor. He'd actually, it had bitten a, a hook that was out for salmon. It was so big. Um, but we had the we had the full complement of age classes. We had kilometers of spawn. My next door neighbor was working for Fisheries and Oceans Canada, DFO, and it was his job, among other things, to assess the herring. Uh, that meant running his boat up and down the area with his sounder on, also going to the beaches where they were spawning and diving in and measuring how thick the spawn was and the spread of it and how deep it occurred. DFO knew herring were important. They spent a lot of effort assessing it throughout the coast. Of course, uh, as you all know, um, the herring feeds so many species and so of course it was important to our bird populations. Our spring salmon, the Chinook, when the herring would arrive in Kinkum Inlet in April and May, the salmon fishing was just incredible. There's 30, 40 pound Chinook salmon were common. I was catching them and I'm a mediocre fisherman at best. And so it was, it was inescapable to see what an energy supply they were, how much they brought to the archipelago, how much depended on them. In 1966, this is a, a publication by the Fisheries Research Board of Canada. This was um, a government science-based group before the Pacific Biological Station. And it was remarkable in that it was independent of the politics of DFO. And it was considered one of the world's premier fisheries research organizations. And in 1966, they did a study on bycatch of salmon in the herring fishery. And part of this report looks at the impacts of lights. And so and these pictures are very poor, um, quite old. But the boats were using very, very bright lights to attract the herring at night to increase their catch. And uh, I, I took an excerpt of the report here, and it said the herring fishing may take place in day or night. Night fishing frequently involves the use of bright lights to concentrate scattered schools of herring. When lights were used in herring fishing op operations, three times as many adult salmon and grills, small salmon, were taken in the sets uh, there was three times more adult salmon taken in sets with lights than without lights. And so very quickly, the next year, 1966, the use of lights on fish boats was prohibited in areas of the BC coast. 
1988, the salmon farms arrived in the Broughton Archipelago. Um, the community of Echo Bay and myself, we all thought they were a good idea. We thought they would take pressure off the wild salmon. Um, we thought they would bring families to our community because we had one of the last one-room schools in Canada. And um, we welcomed the industry. In fact, I offered to talk to women that were thinking of moving out there to work on the farms in case they wondered what it was like to raise children in a remote place with no road access, no ferries, no phones, no electricity. <laughs> and um, But very quickly, we realized that the farms were going into the wrong places. And it wasn't me that realized this, because I was too new to the place to really understand where the fish were. But my fishermen neighbors came to me and asked me to start writing letters to DFO to say, hey, you're putting these where the herring are schooling, the salmon are schooling, the rock cod, the prawns are. In particular, those four species uh, were being impacted just by the sighting of the farms right on top of them. And the farms began to use these lights. And right from the beginning, the fishermen were like, hey, whoa, well, wait a minute. We're not allowed to use lights because it attracts fish. Even DFO fisheries officers that came out to Echo Bay and saw the lights were on at night made comments like, hey, we, we thought that wasn't allowed. They were confused. And the fishermen and local people thought that the farms were turning the lights on to actually feed their fish. So it would attract young fish and the farm, farm fish would gain weight without needing pellets. But the farmers said that they used them to stop the Atlantic salmon from maturing. They just wanted them to get bigger and fatter. They didn't want them to start to sexually mature and grow the big kipes and grow eggs um, because that reduced the quality of the fish and I think it also reduced the size of the fish. But for a long time this debate went on and, and the farmers just won hands down. We were not allowed to look in the farms. Uh, DFO after their initial shock, they went along with it. And so it was a, a point of contention for a long time. Well, in uh, 2016, the uh, Sea Shepherd Society lent me a boat, the Martin Sheen, a big, beautiful sailboat. And we traveled uh, in that boat to all the farms along eastern Vancouver Island and eventually around the entire island and put divers down. And the first thing I noticed was the amount of herring that were outside the farms. This is a school of herring on the left, and you can see the nets, the fish farm nets, on the right. You know, what are these fish doing around the, the pens? They clearly had become comfortable with them. So here you see three herring that are traveling back and forth uh, outside of the uh, outer net. They're just swimming through the predator net but you can see there's a smaller mesh net behind them, and that's what's actually containing the farm salmon. In 2017, when First Nations and myself occupied the salmon farms for 280 days, I was constantly handing people GoPro cameras on poles just to get a look at what is going on inside the farms. And again, there were the herring. They were not only outside the farms, they were inside the farms. So here's a big Atlantic salmon, and the herring are skittering around over top. Every single farm, every single pen, each farm has up to 12 pens, had large schools of herring. There were times where you just couldn't see through the herring to the fish farms. And so it became apparent that the fish farms were also herring farms. They are the biggest herring fishery on this coast because it happens 365 days a year. And we don't really know what happens to these fish that get in the farms. I'm hoping to be able to learn more about this because the First Nations of the Broughton Archipelago have won the authority to to look at what's going on in these farms and, and make some changes. And they're, they're getting rid of the farms uh, a few every year. 
So here you can see um, an Atlantic salmon is actually chasing these herring. The herring are, all the footage I've seen of the herring in the farms, they're darting around. They are constantly in an evasive. But one of the things I noticed is it's not all the farm salmon that are chasing them. There's the most of the farm salmon appear to completely ignore them. They're just big docile fish going around in a circle. But in many of the pens, there were these smaller, more feral, maybe you could say throwbacks. They have more wild tendencies, and they were chasing the fish around. In fact, we got a few shots of the Atlantic salmon actually striking at the herring. And you can see this, this is a small Atlantic salmon, but he's coming up after these, these herring. And quite a few herring had bite marks on them and rake marks. Um, and so there is some concern that the salmon in the pens are feeding on these herring, which could also be seen as a fishery. Due to the laws of Canada, when the herring are in the farms, the government doesn't actually, or the courts don't actually see them as being captured because they say it's the same ocean inside the pen as outside the pen. But <laughs> what happens to those fish inside the pens still remains somewhat of a mystery. My bigger concern, bigger than you know the thought that these Atlantics might be eating some of them, is disease transmission. Because salmon farms are feedlots, and feedlots break all the natural laws that control disease. They put them in a small space, they feed them an artificial diet, they, uh, they're monoculture, so all the fish are very, very similar genetically, and nobody's allowed to migrate. And probably most importantly, there's no predators allowed in. Because salmon in, in the wild have a predator on them from the moment that the egg leaves the mother's body. So when they're spawning, any egg that bounces down the river, boom, it's gone by a trout or one of those little water oozles, the, the birds, the dippers that run underwater. And then as the fish grow, there's kingfishers after them and loons and grebes, and then eventually it's the killer whales and, and the grizzly bears and the eagles. And without these predators, what happens in the farms is the fish that are um, infected can become sick. And then they remain contagious for a long period of time, much longer than would happen in the wild. There was a period of time here um, in about 2016 where so many herring outside the farms had this bleeding out from under the scales. And we never did figure out what was, what was the problem. Um, the fish would appear on the surface panicked going around in circles like they were unable to dive on their sides spinning around and the birds were picking them up which makes you wonder you know are they spreading this whatever it is and it, it just went on and on whenever I see a big disease event in wild fish at this point my first question is did this come from the salmon farms and the problem is we're never able to really get into the farm to answer that question and so I'm hoping to resolve that now but the spreading of disease from these farms is a, a huge issue. It's catastrophic for salmon. And um, in the Broughton Archipelago, commercial fishing was shut down just before I arrived in about 1982. And the herring populations have just continued to nosedive. They're still there, but they're not coming back. And so the beaches are still there. Um, you know, we don't have any big developments in the Broughton other than the farms. There's fewer people than there ever was, you know, for the last 10,000 years. And so my question always goes to, is it disease? Is it entrapment? Is it disruption of their life cycle by these farms that is causing the de decline of the herring? Um, this is a picture inside a fish farm off Dufino, uh, the creative salmon farm. And this this herring has a huge open sore. I mean, it possibly this is a fish strike and the fish is, the salmon has removed the skin of the fish, but there is a disease in these farms called mouth rot, which is very rampant, which causes sores just like that. And then sea lice. So every salmon farm on this coast, like I said, is also a herring farm now. And so the herring are being 
condensed in there and trapped and staying in one place. And whether they can get out or not, I'm not really sure, but I know that they're in there. And that means that these sea lice have an extraordinary opportunity to spread. Because sea lice, you see these little pink tails on the louse in the middle. That's just a whole string of eggs, like little hockey pucks all strung together, and they hatch right off the mother louse. And then they have to swim around for a couple of days before they grow the equipment to grab a fish. So in the wild, as fish are moving continuously, these larval lice, most of them never find a fish. But where everybody's going around in a circle, it would appear that more and more of these lice are finding a host. And so these types, types of outbreaks of sea lice on juvenile salmon have never been reported on this coast. Nobody's ever seen them. There's been, like I said, a lot of work was done in the early years on herring. There was a lot of concern. There was people recognized they were a valuable fish. And if, if, if people had seen herring like this, it certainly would have made it into the literature. So this is new. Now, uh, over the years, going back on the Martin Sheen, I asked the divers to, to really try to concentrate on these herring. Like, what were they doing? Were they just attracted to the structure or something else about the location? But here you can see these fish are going right up to the net. And one of the things I noticed is on these GoPros, you can hear underwater. And when they turn on their uh, feeders, the pellets are rolling down these long black plastic tubes that are floating in the water. And so you can hear that and so can the herring. And so when everything's quiet, the herring were just milling around. But as soon as you could hear those pellets going down the tubes, all the herring were orienting right to the pens. Now, the pellets are too big for these herring. But as the pellets are rolling down the tube, pieces of them are breaking off. And if you are at a fish farm, like at sunset or sunrise with the lights low, you can see this whole cloud of dust that is coming out of these blowers that they're blowing the pellets with. And in this case, you can see this herring um, has his gills flared out. Here's another close-up. I know these are a bit blurry, but they're really big enlargements of GoPro shots. But this fish is clearly feeding. And you can see lots of little bits in the water. Uh, so until somebody can tell me otherwise, it's my view that they are attracted to these farms. They are now addicted to the feed. They're feeding on it. And I don't know what happens to these fish when the farms are harvested and they go fallow for a few months. Do these little herring know how to go out and be herring? Do they know how to catch the zooplankton that they're supposed to be eating? Um, you know, are they infected to the point where they're not living their full life cycle and, and spawning? Something is going very wrong with them because they just continue to decline, decline. And now we have this lovely return of humpback whales. But honestly, I look at all the humpback whales out here and I'm like, oh, guys. <laughs> Could you just give these herring a break for a few years and let them rebuild now that the fish farms are being removed? Of course, the humpbacks aren't listening to me. But um, I, I think it's very important that people realize that where there are herring, there is hope. On this coast, if you have herring, you have the underpinnings of this vibrant ecosystem. You get salmon, you get whales, you feed the, the eagles. And so um, I, we're working very hard to try to get the lights turned off on these farms and just to get the farms out of the water. There's just no way these farms can comply with the natural laws and um, allow these, these ecosystems to thrive. So I'm always surprised that the herring fishermen aren't more concerned about what is going on with the herring in the farms? I've tried to make this public. I've broadcast the photographs. I've sent them to the fishermen. But um, there seems to be a, a tolerance for this interaction between the herring and the fish farms um, that I think is detrimental. And I hope very much that, uh, well, the Broughton will be an experiment. They are getting rid of the farms. It's a beautiful, discrete ecosystem. And we'll see what happens to the herring, and we'll see what happens 
to the salmon, and then we will know the true cost of salmon farming. So consider yourselves very lucky that you still have herring spawning down there. It is certainly a gift, and I appreciate all the efforts that you are making to ensure that that spawn continues. So thanks so much. Thanks, Alex, for your always interesting and inspiring presentation. We're very fortunate this evening to have two of Canada's preeminent fisheries scientists with, uh, with us on Herring Fest. We've got to Dr. John Nielsen and Dr. Robert Rangeley. Dr. John Nielsen was on the boat with us last Herring Fest in March of 2020, and he, uh, we interviewed him on the boat, and he was very, very um, interesting and pointed out a number of things around, uh, around the science of, of herring in the Strait of Georgia. Uh, John is a fishery scientist with experience on marine fish populations in all three of Canada's oceans. He holds a PhD from Simon Fraser University and recently served as co-chair uh, for the Marine Fishery Subcommittee of COSWEC, uh, Canada's scientific authority on the status of endangered wildlife. So we're very fortunate to have John with us this evening. So John, uh, your presentation please. Yes, good day everyone. My name is John Nielsen. I am not a herring specialist, although I've uh, studied fisheries in all three coasts of Canada over a career which uh, spans quite a few decades. And I have tried to get as much information as I can on Pacific herring and uh, become reasonably familiar with this. And I want to share some of the information I've learned about this fascinating species with you today. The major parts of my presentation are what is special about the biology of herring and how does that affect management, the importance of the waters around Hornby and Denman Island for herring, the current status of herring in the Strait of Georgia Salish Sea, and then finally turning to the future, how can we help the Salish Sea herring population thrive? My first consideration from a biological perspective is uh, herring is a, manage, uh, a forage species and really is on the menu for many predators. And DFO has highlighted the importance of, of um, herring for predators such as ling cod and chinook salmon. You can see here in this graphic, it really comprises a, a big fraction of the overall diet for those predators. But this is kind of an incomplete representation. And if you spent any time in the waters around uh, Hornby Island, you would see sites like this, the California sea lion male, I think, uh, chowing down on herring and uh, Glaucus wing gulls, um, harlequin ducks and great blue herons, bald eagles and otters among the cast of characters that are really enjoying a feed of herring during the months of March. And these images, by the way, are courtesy of uh, supporters of Conservancy Horn Beyond. Thank you for allowing me to use these images. And uh, the last image is courtesy of Rainforest Alliance. And here we have a black bear chowing down on some herring spawn on a beach in the central coast of uh, Vancouver Island. So overall, you can see that the, uh, the scenes around Hornby Island in particular form a marine Serengeti wilderness experience, which really is not an exaggeration, as you can see. If you have the opportunity to see it, go and see it. It's really something to see. Take my word for it. So turning again to the critical aspects of biology for management, Herring are repeat spawners. They are not like salmon, where it's one spawning and, and that's it. If you happen to be around Hornby Island in the month of March, you might be fortunate enough to see this site where you'd rub your eyes and think you are on a tropical island as the water turns this lovely turquoise color. Um, uh, so herring are repeat spawner and um, uh, the, the uh, uh, herring release melt into the water in a sort of broadcast way. So this results in the water changing color. And they first spawn when they're three years old, then annually. 
and the eggs themselves are sticky and they often uh, attach themselves to uh, vegetation like this and forming several layers thick. On occasion, if it's particularly stormy, this vegetation will end up in windrows along the, uh, the edge of the beach and in which case the eggs may dry out and uh, suffer quite a bit of loss. Another aspect of the biology of herring for management is that the populations fluctuate greatly. And from this paper by Essington et al., they showed uh, examples of herring populations from around the world. And you can see the sorts of fluctuations from one year to the next, which sometimes are quite extreme. Look at the example in the uh, second from the bottom. And that's Queen Charlotte's herring. And you can see the nature of the variation. And some influential scientists have stated that the usual management approaches which we use do not fully account for these large natural fluctuations or indeed the role that these forage fish play in marine ecosystems. And we'll return to this uh, uh, theme later in the talk. So how do we know where they spawn and the importance of local waters for the resource? DFO conducts intensive and extensive scuba sampling for herring throughout the Salish Sea. These surveys have been ongoing since 1951, but unfortunately there was a significant methodological shift in 1988. And the information is available on three geographic scales shown below. On the right hand side, you can see the most general uh, a low level of resolution showing the whole Salish Sea. Uh, middle panel, we start to home in in the waters around Hornby and Denman Island. And finally, we're looking at the locations, particular locations around the Comox Peninsula in the north and then the two islands there. If we look at each location, and here's a couple of examples off of uh, Denman Island, um, there are established transects which uh, are swum by divers every year to the extent that's possible. And this is off an area called the Comas Bluffs. Those red lines signify the, uh, uh, the lines as swum, as swum by the divers. <clears throat> We can see that uh, from the information DFO has gathered over the years um, that these local waters are really important for the production of herring. Um, as a result of a question asked by Conservancy Hornby Island, I put together DFO data from 1988 to 2019 and I went through an exercise of basically ranking the importance of the 147 unique locations throughout the Strait of Georgia and I simply calculated the average rank importance. Now this table on the right shows the results and location names are leftmost column and the rank is shown in the middle. These are the 20 most important locations in the whole uh, Strait of Georgia. The ones which are uh, geographic areas around uh, Hornby and Denman Islands are highlighted and you can see how important uh, the local waters are for the production of, of herring. You can also see how persistent several sites are from year to year. I took some of the, the three most significant sites, Collishaw Point, Phil and Glay Park and Coma, Comas Bluff and calculated the rank from year to year over time. And you can see that uh, the highly ranked uh, spots don't change much from year to year. Uh, so this is, signifies that the fish in general are returning to a particular area and spawning there. And this was particularly true early in the series. And I'll return to the, the significance of those observations uh, later. Next, I'll discuss how DFO measures abundance. Most fishery 
assessments rely on an index of abundance, and some relationship is assumed or demonstrated between this index of abundance and the actual or true population abundance. These indices can either be fishery dependent or fishery independent, such as from a, a survey. If we have information which is fishery independent, generally speaking, that's considered to be preferred. So in the case of Pacific Caring, the index of abundance is indeed that uh, survey of the spawn I spoke to earlier. These indices are available for five geographic areas. So we have the Strait of Georgia, the Central Coast, Prince Rupert District, Haida Gwaii, and the west coast of Vancouver Island. There are a couple of smaller regions and taken together, DFO thinks they've captured the main stock components for, for herring. But I will note there is controversy on this, as I've heard from some of the email discussions around Pacific herring. Now, looking at some of the trends in the, uh, the index of spawning, uh, if we recall how DFO breaks down the spawn index, there are two sub areas that are close to the Comox Valley. One is lumped together as sub area 14, which includes Denman and Hornby, and that's the purple shading in the middle of the figure. And another of importance is, is Lazo, north of Cape Lazo, the green shading. <clears throat> The overall trend in the abundance index is shown on the right. And as I pointed out, the methodology changed in 1988 and is indicated by the vertical red line. Overall, you can see that the index is following an increasing trend since that point. The lower panel shows the percent contribution to the above index by area. Note the importance of the 14 and 17 group. Uh, now that, as you recall, is Hornby and Denman Island, shown in the purple color. And notice how purple dominates that plot. And the lazo group is the blue component. Also important to note is the the absence of the southernmost area, yellow, in later years. So you see yellow being quite important uh, early in the time series, but diminishing. So that southern component has dropped off. And also uh, the eastern strait of Georgia, the blue component is less important. Um, <clears throat> I misspoke earlier, the lasso group is green. So we see some changes over time. But overall, the Hornby and Denman component is, is really very, very dominant. So speaking now to the stock assessment process for Pacific Caring, uh, Fisheries and Oceans takes catch data from the various fisheries. Um, you can see the spawn on uh, bow fisheries shown there on the bottom left. Um, the same fishery in the middle and the gillnet fishery in the bottom right. And so it gets tonnages, the numbers caught at age, and the abundance index, and integrates those all together to develop the model of abundance. The assessment then provides estimates of biomass at the beginning of each calendar year, and decisions can be made on fishing and how much to take out of the water. So here's the e bottom line from the stock assessment that was completed and published in January 2021. So this is really hot off the press. The trend in spawning stock biomass is indicated by the, the solid black line. And the confidence we have around that solid black line is shown by the gray shading. Uh, so notice how imprecise also that the estimate of biomass is in the final year of the stock assessment, the beginning of the year 2021. So this is not unusual, but actually the overlap and the sort of confidence in that estimate
places it right into that pinkish zone surrounding the red line. The red line, if you recall from Bob Rangeley, Dr. Rangeley's talk earlier, indicates the limit reference point. So there's the estimate of the limit reference point. And so with that kind of imprecision, uh, the stock could be in a poor position. Commercial catch is shown as color, colored bars and the legend is on the bottom. So you have the various gear types reflected by uh, uh, the colors with the row fishery shown in the green and uh, the gill, gill net fishery that is and the row seine fishery shown as a yellow color. <clears throat> Excuse me. So interpreting the stock assessment results, context is important. Um, I have heard reports on the media that uh, the herring roe fishery industry has, has said that biomass has increased. And indeed, if you look at the years the uh, spokesperson referred to, which was 2010 to 20 to 20, they are indeed correct, depending on the starting year. However, if you choose a different point of reference that you can see the stock is down compared with the 1990s, for example. So my point here is that clarity and care is needed to avoid making misleading statements. Uh, so I think this is very important when you consider the status of any fishery resource. Now the audience will have seen this same slide in Bob Rangeley's talk and just in the case of Pacific Caring, we know the target exploitation rate for the fishery has been 20% and that was set regardless of biomass and stock status. DFO is moving towards an approach which better reflects the status of the resource. So if it is in that cautious zone, the rate of exploitation is meant to ramp down depending on if the stock is in a somewhat better or somewhat worse situation. It could even, as he crosses that limit reference point, it could be that the fishery could be as little as conceivably could be or shut down completely. Uh, so those are the range of options which are uh, available using the precautionary approach and DFO uh, according to the management plan and the stock assessment documents which I've read is committed to developing and more fully implementing this. They have defined the limit reference point uh, but they need now to move on to define the upper stock reference point so we know the boundary between healthy and critical and here's where uh, the public can weigh in and there's an opportunity to do so uh, at the same time next year or, or slightly before then. So apart from the stock assessment, there are reasons to be cautious with the Salish Sea herring fishery. There are depleted components elsewhere in BC waters, and I'll give the examples of that. Species that rely on herring, either directly or indirectly, are in some trouble. We can document that. Environmental stress associated with climate change. We don't have a clear idea about how that's going to play out but we are concerned. And lastly, the spatial concentration of spawners. I spoke of this and uh, I'll speak to why I have a particular concern in that regard as well. Turning to the depleted stocks, state of the other major stocks of Pacific Caring. This is from the uh, last year's stock assessment. Those are the fair, four groups which I showed in that earlier figure. And you can see for all four of them, they are quite close to that limit reference point. And indeed, in the case of Haida Gwaii, it was uh, slightly below the limit reference point. So the extent of fisheries, as shown by the bars, has really not been much for some time, and they haven't yet recovered. So these are uh, components which are 
quite depleted compared to their previous uh, history. Other components of the Salish Sea ecosystem are, are in some difficulty. Um, I have been involved with the assessment of Chinook salmon for the organization which deals with the status of endangered wildlife in Canada, COSIWIG, and there are 28 populations of Chinook salmon in southern <coughs> British Columbia, and COSIWIG recently assessed all of them. And here's the scorecard relative to their ranking. 12 of the 28 were assessed at the highest level of risk, and only two of the 28 were considered not at risk. So we can see that uh, there is a strong case to be made that uh, Chinook salmon uh, are in difficulty and need special protection. Looking at other components of the Salish Sea ecosystem, what about seabirds? Um, I am certainly not a seabird biologist, but I was quite impressed by a paper, a uh, recent paper by Ethier et al. 2020, that pulled together 20 years of uh, citizen science observations and compared the status of groups of seabirds on the, in the Salish Sea compared to those counterpart populations on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And you can see it in the graphic on the bottom right. The Salish Sea groups are those which are orange, whereas those on the west coast of Vancouver Island are those which are yellow. And along the bottom axis, you can see the status of those groups on the left-hand side decreasing uh, near that dashed horizontal line that's considered stable then actually increasing. So you can see the west coast of Vancouver Island groups tend to be in a better place relative to the Salish Sea component. Considering another component, a sort of iconic component of our Salish Sea ecosystem, there's the southern resident killer whales, which are much in the news. Historically, it is thought the population was about 200 animals, now down to 72, although we've heard some good news in terms of a birth or two recently, I believe. There is concern over the nutrition and condition of the remaining animals, and ultimately the population, the ability of the population to rebuild. I must say that while a direct relationship between herring abundance and that of southern resident killer whales has not been established to my knowledge, it does seem precautionary uh, to manage herring as though there is a direct relationship, and it seems common sense. Environmental stress associated with climate change. This is another, another aspect which is not very well understood at this point, but there is a, a recent paper from UBC that indicated that climate shifts could strongly reduce the biomass and resilience of herring and its predators. And we know from the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that as the Strait of Georgia herring are faced with increasing temperature and acidity, changes in prey fields and competition from other species. The implications of this are all unknown, but could very well be negative. I already spoke about uh, spawners being increasingly concentrated, and you can see that some small spawning components are being lost, or have already been lost, or at least some could argue that as, as we see this shift in the distribution, we've lost components. And could this represent the loss of important biodiversity that could help the stock sustain pressures such as climate change? We don't know, but it is a, a real possibility and one which we must uh, be concerned with. <clears throat> so given those concerns, what are constructive options for future management? 
In my view, we need to support the uh, precautionary approach and ask decision makers and politicians to implement conservative harvest plans that respects the best information on the abundance and stock structure of Pacific herring. Also, there is evidence that herring have preferred areas for spawning that have persisted over time. Ask policymakers to consider marine protected area in waters near Hornby and Denman Island that protect locations identified as important for spawning. MPAs have been recognized as a kind of insurance policy against unforeseen future events. Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks, John, for your very informative um, presentation and also working with us over, over the last year since we met you on the boat last year. You've been very helpful in our campaign. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Robert Rangeley. Uh, we met him through a report that they put out uh, on the fisheries audit of, of all of the fish in Canada, and specifically they mentioned uh, Pacific herring. Bob received his PhD in marine biology from McGill University. He's brought to Oceana, Canada, uh, and to the Canadian science community, really. Decades of research experience on and under the sea and years of champion championing ocean conservation. We're very fortunate to have Bob make a presentation to us at Herring Fest 2021. Bob, thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Bob Rangeley. I'm a marine biologist and science director at Oceana Canada. Today I'll be talking about the state of Canada's fisheries. I'll focus largely on results from Oceana Canada's annual fishery audit where we assess how well Canada's fisheries are managed. Shown here are the other audit authors, Devin Archibald and Reba McIver. Oceana Canada is a nonprofit organization established in 2015 with offices in Toronto, Ottawa, and in Halifax, where I'm based. We are part of the global Oceana family, active in countries around the world. You can sum up the Oceana mandate by our logo, Save the Oceans, Feed the World. Here's a snapshot of our Canadian campaigns. Uh, I'll be talking mostly about the rebuilding ocean abundance, our fisheries work. We also have a campaign on stopping plastic pollution, protecting North Atlantic right whales, stopping seafood fraud, and protecting marine habitats. You can learn more about these at oceana.ca. Our habitat campaign is largely driven by our results from, from our expeditions. We've done four major expeditions since 2017. The one in uh, a map of it in 2019 was a partnership with the Inuit Nunetsi Abbott government in Northern Labrador. We've done two expeditions with, with these partners in the Pacific, one in the central coast and one of the, on the offshore seamounts. And you can find these at uh, protectoceans.ca. So now on to the fishery audit. Uh, when o Oceana opened in Canada in 20, uh, 2015, it was apparent that there was a lack of transparency about the status and management of our fisheries. We decided to provide that information to, to the public and decision makers with a major report in 2016, followed by an annual audit on stock status and the government progress towards meeting policy and management commitments. We developed a set of science monitoring and management indicators based on global best practices and the policies of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. We use publicly available information from DFO websites, like stock assessment reports and management plans to examine changes in these indicators for 194 marine commercial fish and invertebrate stocks. I'll start with a quick overview of our latest findings. First, we've seen positive developments over the last five years. There have been significant increases in federal fishery science funding. There's much greater transparency and available of fisheries data and we have a new national fisheries monitoring policy and a new fisheries act requiring rebuilding plans for depleted fish stocks. These and other investments 
are very encouraging. Unfortunately, the current pace of change is insufficient to meet the government's own commitments. What we've found is that only a quarter of Canada's fish populations are known to be healthy. Depletion among crustaceans and forage fish seems to be increasing. Overfishing of critically depleted stocks is occurring. Development of effective rebuilding plans has been slow and DFO work plans to implement its own policies are rarely completed on time, nor are there CSAS science publications. Here's a map of all the critically depleted Canadian stocks in 2020, shown with their rebuilding plan status, listed by DFO regional offices responsible for their management. Uh, the check mark means there's a plan in place, the gear symbol in progress, and an X shows those with no plan. It is clear that a lot of the critically depleted stocks are in Atlantic Canada and a lot are ground fish, but there's a couple of worrying trends we've seen since 2017. There are more of the economically valuable invertebrate stocks added to this list. I've just highlighted those in yellow and more forage fish stocks have become critically depleted. You can see those highlighted in, in red. So here we show the stock status of the 194 fish stocks in Canada over the four years of the fishery audit. This uh, plot shows the overall stock health status for the 194 fish stocks in Canada over the four years of the audit. Like I said, this is based on government data and the classification used in the precautionary framework. A healthy stock shown in green is one where the biomass is greater than 80% of the maximum sustainable yield or some proxy. The cautious zone is between 40 and 80% MSY and the critical is less than 40%. Uncertain means the reference points to determine status have not been developed. So since 2017, we've seen a decrease in the percent of healthy stocks down from about 35% to just over 26% in 2020. At the same time, the percentage in the cautious and critical zones have increased. The percentage of stocks that have an uncertain status has remained about the same over this period, which is surprising given federal government investments in science capacity to do more assessments and reference point development. We analyze a number of science management and monitoring indicators in our fishery audit. The graph here shows the DFO precautionary approach framework. On the y-axis, you can see the removal rate, which is mostly fishery mortality relative to stock status. Health status is evaluated using reference points. So the limit reference point identifies the boundary between the critical zone and the cautious zone where the critical zone here is where serious harm is occurring to the stock. And then in here is the critical or the cautious zone. Well, the upper stock reference point is the boundary between the cautious and, and the healthy zone, the point at which stocks, stock is fully sustainable. So management must keep removals as low as possible when in the critical zone and decrease them if the stock starts to decline out of the healthy zone through the cautious zone. And we should stop fishing when we're in the critical zone. In our fisheries audits, we've seen significant improvement in the percent of stocks with limit reference points. So they've jumped from 53 to 60, almost 64% in the four years of the audit. So that's encouraging. But only half our stocks have an upper stock reference point, the boundary line to the healthy zone. Without identifying an upper reference point or target biomass in the healthy zone, it's hard to develop effective harvest rules for managing a stock for long-term sustainability. We also looked at catch monitoring indicators. Uh, we have them for most of our fisheries, but, but they were initially designed in the 1980s to deal with enforcement issues. Now the data from these programs is being increasingly relied on to inform science and conservation. So you can see here we have, uh, you know, quite a lot of, uh, most of our fisheries have some level of, you know, either at sea monitoring, some level of mon uh, mandatory logbooks or some level of uh, dockside monitoring. However, DFOs recognize the inadequacies and the inconsistencies in the programs and released a new policy in 2019 aimed at standardizing program design and ensuring adequate information is collected according to the conservation risk of the fishery. So why does this matter? Well, we're supposed to be managing for all sources of fishery removals on a stock, not just reported commercial landings. This includes non-target fisheries that cat catch the stock as bycatch and recreational fisheries. 
So each year we take a look at how many stocks have estimates of fishing mortality or the rate of fish removals due to fishing as an estimate by the models. And we've seen no improvement in this indicator as it's consistently around 20% shown here. So those stocks with mortality estimates ranged from, well, basically have been around 20%. Few stocks fully account for fisheries mortality in the estimation, including that for bycatch. So we urgently need this new policy to be implemented to enable management to account for all sources of removals when making those critical harvest rate decisions. Ken has had a policy requirement to develop rebuilding plans for critical stocks for over a decade now. And as we can see here, few stocks have them. And despite increased focus in the last four years, there's been little improvement. So you can see in 2017, about 11.5% of our critical stocks had rebuilding plans, and that's only increased to 18.2% in 2020. This tardy, tardy progress might change now that we have an amended Fisheries Act that requires rebuilding plan development for stocks at or below their limit reference point. For now, the legislation doesn't apply to any stocks as the regulations are currently only in draft form and can take years to enact. You can find the, uh, those regulations um, under the Canada Gazette one at this uh, website here. We must demand that regulations set clear targets and timelines for rebuilding stocks to healthy levels. So here we looked at annual landings by uh, all the reported landings by stock and explored what percentage of each of these seven taxa groups was coming from which health status zone. So we sorted them by flatfish, forage fish, ground fish, invertebrates, large plyogenes, rockfish and redfish, and sharks and skates. So you can see the percentage of annual reported landings and basically where those groups come from. The number of the volume is shown at the bottom. I'll just focus on one here, and, and it's the most startling finding that over 54% of forage fish annual landings are coming from critically depleted stocks. In Canada, most commercial fisheries for forage fish target four species, Atlantic mackerel, Cape one, Atlantic herring, and Pacific herring. In terms of ecosystem function, of course, there are other very important forage species like shrimp and sand lance and Arctic cod. There's strong evidence that we should be leaving more forage fish in the ocean beyond what a single stock management would recommend. Forage fish are not only hugely important to the ecosystem, they're also a source of bait for some of our most lucrative fisheries like lobster and crab. Overfishing for forage fish is a big problem at many levels. Forage fish link lower trophic or energy levels in the ecosystem with higher levels. And commercial fish species rely on forage fish so much so that for Forage fish, are, forage fish are estimated to be worth twice as much in the water as they are in the net, as reported by the Lenfast uh, group. So globally, forage fish have about 5.6 billion direct value of the catch, and twice that uh, if you look at you know, what they support in terms of uh, commercial catch of other species. The federal government has repeatedly stated it is committed to the long-term sustainability and conservation of our fish stocks. However, fish stocks are in decline. Only about one quarter of them can be confidently considered healthy. Our recommendation to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans can be summed up as close the implementation gap. Policy development isn't the issue. It is the gap in putting those policies into action, resulting in real measurable change on the water. Canada's had a policy requirement for the development of rebuilding plans for critical stocks for over a decade now, but few stocks have them. We have a recently amended Fisheries Act that requires rebuilding plan development for stocks at or below their limit reference point. That legislation doesn't apply to any stocks as the draft regulations in Canada Gazette 1 were just available for public comment in January. DFO must improve the draft regulations that set clear targets and timelines for rebuilding stocks to healthy levels. Should also start implementing the fishery monitoring policy so we can ensure we have the best data possible to manage all sources of removals. Currently only 20% of stocks have fishing mortality estimates. And we need to implement high quality rebuilding plans for all depleted stocks and manage all stocks for long-term sustainability. Less than 20% of our 33 critical stocks have plans this year. 
Among the stocks in the critical zone are many of our forage fish, such as herring, mackerel, and capon. And as I said, one of the most startling findings is over half of those forage fish annual commercial landings are coming from critically depleted stocks. There is strong evidence we should be leaving more forage fish in the ocean beyond that which a single stock management would recommend. This would be for the benefit of other, other species dependent on them for food, such as larger commercial species like salmon, cod and tuna, or seabirds and whales. We need to call on the fisheries minister to agree that this critical role of forage fish in the ecosystem should be taken into account in all future quota setting. Thank you for joining me in this presentation. I have a few uh, closing thoughts to leave you with. Uh, Oceanic Canada's fishery audit uses basic stock information and evaluates the performance of the federal government against their commitments to improve fisheries management. This is largely a single stock focus. But moving towards ecosystem-based management is a must, as we see with issues such as forage fisheries. Other issues such as habitat loss, pollution, and climate change are impacting the health of our oceans. We must make sure that our actions take into account these threats if we are to unlock Canada's potential for an abundant ocean. Thanks, Bob, for your excellent presentation and providing the facts on the state of Canada's fisheries. Now, we're off to our live discussion. Thank you. So thank you everyone for uh, joining us today and, and thank all the speakers, um, Chief Ernest, Alexander Morton, John Nielsen and Bob Rangeley for your um, very informative talks. Um, so we're gonna take about 15 minutes now to answer questions specifically to um, uh, those speakers. And then we're gonna open up the floor to all our present presenters as well as uh, our MP, Gord Johns, who's the NDP uh, fisheries critic. Um, so the first question is for John or Bob. Um, we know that the salmon depend on the herring. Which species did the herring depend on further down the food chain? Is human activity also degrading those species? Hi there, Kath, it's uh, John. Um, so if you could just repeat that question again, please. I, I didn't pick that up entirely. Okay, we know that the salmon depend on, depend on the herring. Which species do the herring depend on further down the food chain? Is human activity also degrading those species? Right. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, zooplankton such as Calinus uh, are very important for herring. And uh, as far as I'm aware, human impacts on zooplankton um, in the Salish Sea uh, are not well understood, but I imagine that might be something affected by climate change. There is some concern that, as I mentioned during my talk, that prey fields are gonna change as a result of uh, climate change. Uh, so yeah, there, there is some indications that things may change for, for species that herring rely upon as well, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so for Alex or Chief Ernest, why are an invasive species like Atlantic salmon still allowed to be farmed in open pen hatcheries in Canadian Pacific waters? And is there any pressure being put on DFO to stop this practice that is so destructive to the wild stocks of salmon and possibly herring stocks too? You wanna take that Ernest? Uh, well, um, nothing is being done to, to, to stop uh, Atlantics versus Pacifics because honestly, they're both just as bad. They both amplify pathogens. And for example, in Norway, they're farming Atlantics, which are native to Norway and genetic pollution due to the escape of these farmed Atlantics is their number one problem. And then they have all the problems we have. But I would say that uh, First Nations on the east side of Vancouver Island uh, in the Broughton region, so three nations there and seven nations in the Discovery Islands are just trying to get rid of the industry completely and are in the process of doing that. So, um, and that's the better solution, just 
no more in the water, in the ocean. If you really want to farm them, do it on land like they're doing it elsewhere in the world. Okay. Um, Dr. Nielsen, what determines the red line limit shown on your slides? What if this line is too low? Could this lower limit be challenged? Right. So the red line, which uh, is shown on those plot, refers to what's called the, uh, uh, the lower stock reference, and that establishes the critical zone where there should be little or no fishing. So currently that's 0.3 of uh, spawning stock at diversion levels, unfished levels. Uh, so you could go for a, a uh, higher level and that would provide a higher level of protection for the stock overall. But I think it's at least as important to establish the so-called upper stock reference, which you saw in Bob Ragley's talk as well in the precautionary approach because that sets the level where you start to ramp the fishery down. Uh, right now we have a sort of on off switch for the fishery. And what we really need to do is to recognize that there is a critical, or sorry, a cautious zone for the fishery where the fishery effort must be ramped down. That's the intent of Canada's approach for the precautionary uh, principle. And we need to implement this, thanks. Okay. Um, someone is asking, would we be more successful advocating to the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations? DFO seems overly focused on maintaining high commercial catch levels. Not sure who's best to answer that. Maybe Chief Alfred. <clears throat> uh, there we go. Uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is a this is a really interesting time for for everybody. Uh, when we talk about um, the reconciliation with First Nations people and uh, what that really means and, and the legwork that uh, is required. And, and uh, I'm, I'm curious, and this should be a question maybe to uh, Mr. Gord Johns, um, because it, 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 it really has to, it really has to uh, start there because I, I think we're we're all really very aware of what what is going on here on the ground, but does that reflect, you know, what is happening within the chambers and what is happening within uh, those government offices? Because um, there is a fi fantastic opportunity here for uh, DFO has made uh, serious, significant decisions lately that are going to have huge impacts on, on, on our relationships going forward. And, and, and I think um, there are people listening to us. There are people within those government buildings that are, uh, that are listening to um, the traditional knowledge and, and the people uh, here on the ground. And I think that's incredibly important. And if you wanna talk reconciliation, um, even though Mr. Trudeau and, and, um, and the Liberal government are, are doing all kinds of crazy things, along with Mr. Horgan, uh, there, there, there is an effort to, uh, to reconcile, if you will. And this means um, this has implications and, and has broad ranging, um, long term lasting effects. Uh, for First Nations people going forward, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there, but um, I I hope I hope that um, I hope that everybody realizes and 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 understands that it's it's going to uh, it's going to take some serious um, commitment here, and I think uh, I think that we should uh, we should hear from the government. We've said our piece. If Gord, if you could just respond to Chief Ernest and then we'll move on to another couple of questions and you'll need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me okay, Kath? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, good, good. Well, thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for, uh, to, obviously to CHI for organizing the event and I wanna thank Chief Alfred and all of the other panelists for this morning's presentation. It was very informative and uh, expansive. Um, in terms of the question 
uh, regarding who should whose mandate it should be when it comes to um, fisheries and whether it be DFO being the decision maker or this be rights and reconciliation when it comes to the crown. It, it's a very good question and something that I've been raising on a regular basis, uh, especially when it comes to an, an, uh, treaty rights or um, inherent and Aboriginal rights and title when it comes to um, you know their their right to make an, uh, a living and, and uh, food and uh, ceremony obviously is already covered. Um, but uh, in terms of this fishery and the politics of it, I mean, the, the minister is constantly saying she supports uh, local and Indigenous knowledge. She repeats that all the time in the House of Commons and in the public, um, but she doesn't respect that and honour it on the ground. And, and that's something that we've seen from the East Coast, from the Sabag and Agati in the Mi'kmaq uh, fishery uh, uh, dispute that's happening right now over their moderate livelihood, which is uh, obviously protected uh, under the Marshall decision. It was reaffirmed, but uh, a treaty protected right uh, to the West Coast. And, and I would say the strength of, um, you know, the, the closure of the four of the five fish herring fishery grounds on the West Coast has been led by First Nations and Indigenous communities that have uh, sometimes had to go as far as to the courts, as we saw in the Central Coast with the Heltzik and the New Chalnuth. Um, and uh, there is an argument that it should be uh, Crown Indigenous relations and Minister Bennett at the table. And I've spoken to the minister repeatedly on this. But when we talk specifically about um, the Salish Sea and this herring uh, fishery right now, um, this herring fishery is taking place in the Comox and the Qualicum uh, Nations territory. And um, th their perspective and, and listening to them is that they would like to see it curtailed, uh, not shut down. And they haven't asked me to take this to uh, Minister Bennett's office. And if they did, I would absolutely advocate uh, uh, there uh, as other nations have had on their fisheries in other areas where I am speaking to Minister Bennett uh, on fisheries related issues. I know it's not the, the simplest answer, but um, it, it tends to be specific, but over, uh, over oh, in that overall, Minister Bennett should be at the table when it comes to all uh, uh, rights and reconciliation issues and, and fisheries are top of mind. Every nation in our riding, there's 10 nations. The first conversation that we start off with uh, is, is always fish. It starts there. Uh, you'd think it would be housing or uh, you know, infrastructure, the different issues, child welfare, that, they're, that, that they are top of mind, of course. But salmon and uh, fisheries is always the very top issue. And they all agree that Minister Bennett should be at the table when those discussions are taking place. Thank you, Gord. Um, we'll just take another few minutes to direct questions to, um, to, the, to this morning's panelists. Um, Alex, somebody was asking, I imagine like in many areas, there were perhaps voices that said, don't put up new salmon farms, make the old ones better. There are people working in them, et cetera. If so, how did you deal with it? And if not, why was that the case? We, we've tried to do that since, uh, well, approximately 2001. Uh, there was a coalition of environmental groups that formed around my first sea lice findings. And they did everything they could to encourage a better industry, a land-based industry. They approached the province for funding. And this was groups like Living Oceans and Watershed Watch and David Suzuki Foundation and several First Nations. Um, but the industry just said no. And the, the problem is you can't make them better. Uh, they are a feedlot and feedlots have to be closed off because they break all the natural laws. And so we have fooled around with it for 35 years. And now, I don't know if people realize, but only 20 sockeye came back to the Shushwap River. This is part of the Fraser River system. 20, not 17,000, 20. And so we are, and, and like Knights Inlet when in the Broughton had 0.1% of the pink salmon return. And I have watched those fish get eaten by sea lice every single year. We tried drugs on the farms. We tried this, that, and the next thing, and none of it worked. So we're down to the wire and um, experimenting with the wild stocks. We're, we're, the only step left is, is extinction. I do feel for the people on the farms, absolutely. They are caught in the middle of this. And, and so the government response really has to be to find them new jobs, uh, help them, 
transition to something else, uh, support the Canadians who are doing land-based. The Norwegians have said they don't want to do it. So, okay, see you guys. But there are Canadians that are doing it already and they reuse the waste to grow lettuce, to grow water lentils, to grow cannabis. There's a lot of creativity uh, and jobs in that. And so I think going forward, the, the government should speak with them, but we've tried uh, with the Norwegian companies and the problem they have is their uh, economy of scale. They have to be big and get bigger every year because they're based on share price or basically they don't wanna do this. And, and they just can't, you can't have one group of fish grow relentlessly in an ecosystem without ecosystem collapse, which we will also lose the salmon farming industry as well in the end. So we tried, it couldn't be done and, and we have to go drastic now. Thank you, Alex. Um, a question for Bob, is, DF, is DFO sincerely committed to the recommendations that Oceana Canada presented? Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, well, I'm less interested in sincerity and actually more interested in uh, measurement and uh, uh, demonstrating action. Uh, that's what our fishery audit's all about. And it's, it's not um, the sincerity, if you want to call it that, is there because uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans has made uh, numerous commitments, as I alluded to in the talk, um, including um, after the increase in uh, fisheries transparency that we saw uh, around 2016, um, developing work plans uh, against these um, against these measures, uh, and now those work plans we we measure uh, performance. I think the the most disappointing aspect here is. Um, and one of the things that's proven in other jurisdictions is to have a legal requirement for fisheries rebuilding and sustainable fisheries. That's what we thought our, our newly amended Fisheries Act would do for us. Um, that's come up short. And, um, and so now we're looking to fisheries um, rebuilding regulations uh, uh, to do that job. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, the the first draft of those regulations came out under the Canada Gazette one uh, in January, and uh, there are no requirements to rebuild to target healthy levels uh, and, um, and no timelines associated with it. So those now Department of Fisheries and Oceans is now deliberating on those uh, recommendations on the draft plan. So we're very much hoping to see, um, you know, see better uh, rebuilding plan regulations. Just one example. The other one, uh, more topical on this conference, is the um, around managing forage fish, and we definitely need to see. Uh, you know, we get we hear a lot of response around um, needing to take into account ecosystem considerations. There's a pretty straightforward approach to that with with respect to forage fish, and just leave more of them in the ocean, and we can't manage them as um, as we do. Um, you know, other, other stocks. So in terms of the target harvest levels uh, and so on. So those are a couple of things in monitoring our fisheries, we need to see action. So. Okay, thank you, Bob. So thank you for the question. Uh, so the, the, uh, the panel for this morning's speakers is, um, I think we're done with that. Um, and we did have, uh, because Gord wasn't exactly sure if he could join us live. We did have a recorded um, introduction from Gord. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Hornby Island Conservancy for hosting the 2021 virtual Herring Festival. And I want to thank everybody for joining uh, wherever you are, whether you're in the Comox or uh, unceded territory of the Qualicum people, or whether you're at home in another community and you're uh, on the unceded territory of the homelands where you, you reside. I wanna thank you for your dedication and your commitment to protecting our herring uh, in the Salish Sea and up and down the coast of British Columbia. Uh, we have been working diligently as we know collectively to ensure that we raise awareness about the importance of herring to our ecosystem and the interconnectedness of herring to the species that rely on it. We know that uh, herring is the basis of the food web that supports salmon and killer whales and humpback whales, uh, lingcod and uh, various different uh, halibut and other species and especially our seabirds which are on steep decline. 
uh, that are reliant on the herring for uh, their food source. Uh, we have been raising calls to action uh, up and down the coast about the importance of herring to that food web, calling for a whole of ecosystem management based approach to protect uh, our herring stocks and forage fish, which are the bedrock species of our ecosystem. The coast has been united. We've seen uh, Islands Trust unanimously call for a suspension of the herring fishery. The Association of Vancouver Island Municipalities almost unanimously uh, call as well for a suspension and moratorium on the herring fishery until a, a whole of ecosystem management based uh, approaches in, in place. And we've heard from local First Nations that have either called for it to be suspended or to be heavily curtailed until a, a whole of ecosystem management plan is, is there. Uh, we continue to hear from the Minister of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans that she supports local and Indigenous knowledge and local decision making. But clearly, uh, she has been not listening to coastal communities who are united. And, and again, I talked about local First Nations wanting the herring fishery either suspended or curtailed. When you go uh, up and down the coast, you find many of the nations that are calling for this fishery to be suspended uh, because their fisheries are closed. Four of the five fisheries, herring fisheries in British Columbia are closed right now because of overfishing. And uh, Indigenous people understand the significant importance herring is for their own food source, for their economy, for their culture, uh, and for their way of life, and, and how important it is to the ecosystem. And so they have been fighting to protect uh, our, the herring on the coast of British Columbia for too long. And the government needs to listen to the, to the, to the, to the nations and to coastal communities and come back with a really important herring recovery plan uh, as soon as possible. So we're, we're calling on the government to make a decision to do the right thing and suspend the herring fishery in the, in the Salish Sea with a herring recovery plan that supports those fishers and the communities that might be impacted. Um, also to ensure that, you know, we're, we're, when we're fishing any species that it's for food purposes only. Uh, right now we know that only 25% of all herring consumed uh, is used for 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 food sir uh, uh food um the rest of it is used for either cat food or for agriculture purposes or even fish farm feed uh and that's completely unacceptable to be uh killing herring uh, you know taking food out of the ecosystem uh without a whole of ecosystem management plan uh in place uh for uh not even for food consumption it's uh it's just something that you know we're hearing from up and down the coast that this is unacceptable and people want to see the minister do the right thing um, and that's to protect that that those herring stocks and ensure that we're getting higher value for all of our fish uh, that we're, we're taking out of the ocean and removing from the ocean but also looking at the whole of ecosystem uh, management plan so that w everything we know is interconnected we hear that constantly from first nations and the importance of listening to that indigenous knowledge so that we're protecting the, the whole ecosystem and all the species that rely on it. So again, um, we're hoping that the minister will do the right thing. Listen to local and indigenous knowledge, protect the herring in the Salish Sea, and also to listen to coastal voices when it comes to how the management of herring should take place and, uh, and, and ensure that we have herring for generations uh, to come. And so this is an important thing that we're all working collectively on. I want to thank each and every one of you for signing petitions, for joining today's uh, event, and for continuing to advocate to protect our coast and the ecosystem that we all rely on for our food uh, security, for uh, our, our financial and economic security, our culture and our way of life. And uh, together we will get this done, but we need the minister to listen to coastal voices and, and actually practice what she preaches when she says she's listening to local and indigenous knowledge. Again, I wanna thank everybody, especially the, the scientists that uh, are, are bringing forward really valuable information so that we can better understand the interconnectedness and the importance of herring to our uh, ecosystem and all of the species that rely on it. Thank uh, to, again, the organizers and everybody that have been putting this event together. Thank you. Gaila Kasla.
think we'll just, I saw Dana in the background there. Dana, if you'd like to join us, um, I think we're moving on to the entire panel uh, discussion. And um, one of the first, one of the questions that I think is a really great one is which, what does each panelist feel the call to action of this conversation is? Where do we direct this energy now? Maybe we could start with Alex. We could go kind of from top to bottom of the panelists. Uh, well, you know, I'm so focused on the salmon farms. I'm going to say that uh, the Minister of Fisheries needs your support right now because the three Norwegian companies are suing her. I'm applying to become an in intervener in that lawsuit so it can bring some of the science to it. Um, I, it is not a political issue, but right now we have a minister who has gone way out on a limb to say close down 19 salmon farms in the Discovery Islands, which is one of the few fisheries decisions I've ever seen that will actually uh, protect and give fish some relief. So if you could write to um, Minister Bernadette Jordan and, and say you support this decision, it's gonna release a lot of herring as well from those farms. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Bob, would you like to answer that question too? Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> I kind of feel like I already have in a way as I put recommendations in my talk. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's just thinking back to the, the last question in terms of, um, you know, is the, uh, the, you know, is the government serious about these changes? And we, you know, we can't forget there are an awful lot of good people in government and we've got some very good in DFO in particular, and we've got some, you know, good policy out there that we're not following. And that's the frustrating part. We, we do get the commitments. We get the commitments verbally. Uh, we get the commitments uh, in policy. The problem is so much of this isn't binding. So I would say just to, to go quickly, I mean, uh, the, the evidence is showing um, challenges with our oceans with respect to depleted stocks, overfishing in particular, and stocks that haven't recovered. So we've got to rebuild those. And, and there's ways to activate on that. Uh, you can go to our website or you can approach the minister yourself around uh, you know, having a strong uh, rebuilding plan regulations. And the other thing is uh, taking into account the ecosystem, that is crucial. Um, let's not forget all the challenges we're facing here with our, our fisheries that we've been discussing today. Um, the, it becomes so much more difficult with a changing ocean as we're seeing with uh, climate change, which has been mentioned and John mentioned it as well. Um, and so we have to be much more adaptable and nimble and stick with the uh, best science because things are going to, things are changing already as we're seeing in our ocean. So I would say uh, climate change adaptation in our, the management of our fisheries and our marine ecosystems and, um, and uh, you know, leaving, leaving more of those forage fish behind for uh, all those that are dependent on it. So we need the commitment from the federal government to take it into account forage fish, their important role in the ecosystem. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Chief Ernest. Just need to unmute yours. There we go. There we go. Hello. <clears throat> I, wa I want to uh, I want to thank the previous presenters and and their scientific knowledge because um, we really have to move away from um, this sort of idea that that science can become taken into question, you know, um, for for years, for years, we've heard the alarm bells going off, and and yet there's people like Alexandra, my my sister Koyemzi, um, Christy Miller, and uh, there's a long list of people that we we've we that uh, society or industry has put up. And and try to tear down. And 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 um, but there's a missing piece here, the, the traditional knowledge piece. The people of the First Nations have known about this even before the science was in. And and that really what I would would like to leave with everybody is that what we what we really need to do, and I'm going to show, and I'm going to say this until I die: is when are we going to start putting the eco back in economy? Eco back in economy. I love I love that phrase because it because 
because we've, we've a actually torn down everything here and, and we, we know exactly the path that we need to take, but uh, whatever it is, you know, whatever money we can sort of milk out of this is, is clouding our judgment. And so I, I say we put um, credible science back, back on in, in as a forefront, but also recognizing the traditional knowledge that has been here for thousands of years. We know exactly what we need to do. We just need to give Mother Nature a break. And if we get the hell out of her way, we're going to see um, some Im improvement. And, and, I, and I say, um, we can, we can, we're in a position to do that. We just need the willpower and the political uh, support to make sure that, um, you know, we don't, nobody wants to see any of this go away. And so I'm going to reach out to the fishermen that might be sitting online and just say, you know what, we're trying to protect. We're trying to protect the very fish that you're trying to catch. Right? Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. I've got to go. Thank you. Thanks for your incredible talk. It's very passionate and inspiring. Um, so, um, John, uh, what's the next call to action? Where do we direct our energy now? Well, I've been thinking a bit, a little bit about this as the previous speakers have uh, responded. But the thing that struck me over the last couple of days, and this was a consistent theme, was that it seems to me that we really don't have a great understanding of the stock structure of herring. And this came through from the perspective of uh, Dr. Penn's talk, um, uh, David Suzuki, Dr. Suzuki's comments about losses of spawning components. And I saw that myself when I looked at DFO's data from year to year. And yes, we can see we've lost uh, spawners at the southern end, um, but yet we don't have a full recognition of this. We have new science evidence coming out in a paper in 2020, which suggests that uh, there's more diversity out there than we fully appreciate with the existing model. I think it's time and perhaps an excellent time to bring in First Nations information uh, on stock structure uh, together with the new Western science and in the form of a, a very important uh, stock structure meeting to provide a better foundation to manage the resource. So I, I personally, I think this is a, a really good start for going forward. So that's that's what I would suggest, and I'd, I'd uh, really like to hear what other panelists have to think about that as well. Okay, uh, Bryony? Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more, John. I think the, um, I think that the work that has just come out, um, published in the Royal Society by a whole host of, of um, fishery scientists is is fundamental to the conversation. Since it's been the primary argument for DFO about why they're not managing, why they're managing these stocks in a kind of clumsy, large metapopulation, which bears no resemblance to any of the realities of, of those of us who've, and, and, you know, communities have been living on these shores for thousands of years. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's sort of, you know, DFO's handling, is, it, it seemed like a sort of um, a kind of nonsense. And I think this is really a good opportunity to, to bring this back um, right to DFO. And I've actually sent that letter saying, could you please respond? Um, here's the data that you've been, you've been sort of saying hasn't existed, um, but it also conforms exactly to what, you know, elders have been saying for, I mean, I think the first protest I went on was 25 years ago, um, which begs to the question of what, what should we do? And, you know, I'm someone that um, I will stand by those that, that know it, I'll stand by. And so a call to action 25 years ago to stop the, the herring fishery and give it a break was made by, I remember elders and Shemanus and we all marched around. Um, so I, I think that the task ahead is that we have an ecosystem of, of different 
people inhabiting the herring world and that are wanting to do something. And so we've got a whole variety of things we need to do. And those who want to do direct action and boycott um, industry that the, the slipper skippers um, should be doing that. I think that the scientists need to go get into the offices of DFO and, and share the information. I think um, I'm just hold up my hands to Gord for his tireless work in the political arena. It can't be rewarding at all. Alex, you know, your work is, um, has been pivotal. Uh, I, I think uh, John Burroughs, I was listening to John Burroughs the other day and he says nuance is sacred and I really want to leave everybody with that um, because it echoes also Chief Eric Pelkey's notion that the, the, the herring is a nuanced species. It is, there is so much that we don't understand about this incredible little fish. And it has ducked and weaved around predators for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, it, it is, it's about nuance. And I think we need to carry that nuance both into our discussion of science and policy and, and support the, uh, those who are at the front line. Thank you, Bryony. Um, so over to Gord now. Um, Gord, there are two questions that I think might be uh, appropriate for you on, on top of what uh, the other panelists have been talking about. One is, is there an opportunity to frame this in a COVID build back better way so that the federal government is more likely to support it? And do you think it is time for all the concerned parties to hold a West Coast Fisheries Protection Conference with all stakeholders and concerned parties and invite the various ministers? Good questions. Um, first, when it comes to like COVID recovery, I, 100%, that's what I keep saying to the government is that uh, wild salmon for sure has to be part of the, the COVID recovery. In fact, we're hoping we're gonna see a wild salmon budget in this budget. And how uh, this relates to COVID recovery in terms of the herring, there was a report done at FOPO, the Fisheries and Oceans uh, Committee, um, called Sharing Risks and Benefits. And it was focused entirely on the commercial fisheries. And there was 20 recommendations. The government has not acted on any of the recommendations. Everybody agreed on them. commercial fleet. And the top two that they want to see enacted are, we want to know who owns the quota. Just a simple public registry. We don't even know who owns the quota and they want to stop the sale of foreign ownership. Have, have the government, if the minister actually acted and, and she says she's looking at these things, she keeps saying that over the last year, um, we might be able to start to dissect who owns the quota. And if we identify it's in the hands of very few, which we know a lot of it is, or if it's foreign owned, we can start to push the government to start to change that model. The model's broken put the quota in the hands of the fishers, then you can reduce the allowable catch. And, and, and actually the profits stay on the boats and in the hands of people in coastal communities. Then we can see what a reduction fishery looks like. I mean, no pun intended, um, but uh, you know, in terms of reducing the amount of fish, but we also need to add value to this fishery. Clearly if it's being used, uh, the bulk of it for, for fertilizer, for non-human needs, mm -hmm. that we got a big problem. And so, those are fundamental things that we need to look at when it comes to COVID. And I mean, what kind of COVID recovery isn't bringing our ecosystem back to abundance? I mean, we have to have and rely on science and take an old whole of ecosystem management based approach. We haven't done that. And it's something that uh, is clearly breaking down. I mean, the current fishery harvest models have failed the coast of uh, British Columbia largely, and it's failed the communities. And I know a lot of the people working on those boats, they're not profiting from this, but they rely on that fishery to feed their families and to get by. Um, again, I've, I've got cousins that are out there fishing. They're not very happy with my position, but I, we are working for them. We're fighting for them so that there's fish in the future. We're fighting so that the profits stay in their hands, not in the hands of armchair share fishers. And these are really important priorities. So it does go hand in hand, the, econ the economy and the environment, and also, the, the fishery model is really broken and it's causing huge pressures on the ecosystem as we, we know, and that has to change. And that's a priority of mine. Okay. 
Well, we haven't heard from Dana yet about uh, her um, suggestion about where we direct our energy now. Well, I can talk personally as a scientist. I am going to continue to bring everything I can to the discussion. And that means um, being the best Western scientist I can, which means listening fully to traditional knowledge and indigenous science. And then bringing that forward, not only in the scientific literature, which is important because it gets cited as Bryony has told us about the recent genetic study, but also talking to the press whenever I can and doing websites and as much outreach as I can. And many of you on the panel and in the audience have devoted your lives to this as well. So getting the word out whenever you can. But I just, I also think just at a personal level as well, it means voting for the right people and making sure that everybody that I know and will listen to, and in my case, I, my students, vote for people that you know will be defending what you want. And so Gord, many thanks from all of us. Um, and I wonder really how we can support Gord and how do we get other politicians to listen to the stance that science is important. If you're paying attention to the science, then you would not be handling the fishery the way you are. If you're paying attention really to UNDRIP and indigenous rights, largely, you would not be handling the fishery the way you are. So Gord, I'd love, thank you from all of us and to everybody on the panel, but I would like to hear really how can we support our politicians to get the ministries to hear? I take it you're wanting me to answer that, Kat? Um, yes, please. Dana, thanks for your work. Thanks for everyone in the communities for your important work. I mean, we wouldn't be having this conversation without it, without concerned residents. So starting there, you know, at the grassroots, on the water, uh, the front line of this, identifying that we're, we're under a serious threat. And as someone who lives on the West Coast, watching the collapse of the heron, herring in New Chalna territory, for real, like knowing that this happens, if under the current harvest model, it doesn't work. Um, we know that. So your herring stocks are under pressure. The, 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 the department and the fishers will tell you that it's healthy, but when it's not, it's almost impossible to bring back. It's going to take decades, as you can ask the Snedawas or the Liamen or Wasanich, all of those nations where they've been harvested out, if you want to call it that, and they don't have the, the spawn that they had, that they need, they require for the whole ecosystem to function in, and, and in an abundant manner. Um, that's got to happen. In terms of political action, writing to Minister Jordan, calling her out, protesting DFO's offices, not the staff, but the offices, because you're protesting the government. I think that's a good target um, versus the fishers because they're, they're again, they're under the, the, the purvey of the government, the people that are out on the water, um, the, sh the, 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 the shareholders. When we find out, we need to know who owns this quota, demanding that we know who owns the quota, that it's a public fishery, that we should know, we have every right as Canadian taxpayers, to know who owns this fishery in terms of the quota, and 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 uh, and then we can dissect it, and and then when we know who the concentrated shareholders are, go after them and and ask them to press the government too to change the model. But most important, I think, really, is uh, continuing to share the science and educate people, and calling on the government to take a whole of ecosystem management-based approach. And what's absolutely critical and has been su su successful in the other four fisheries is engaging First Nations and having conversations with them, listening to them, uh, uh, their, like you cited local, their indigenous knowledge piece, but also, I mean, they're stakeholders in this fishery and they do have concerns, but they also need to have uh, partners. So ensuring that those conversations are taking place and, um, and, and supporting them in their calls to action. So that's critical and that's how the fisheries in the, in the health of Kaidakwai and and the West Coast have all, uh, you know, changed in terms of shifting from a, a you know, a, a, a hair, a, the row fishery to the the row and kelp. So, 
um, that, that's made a huge difference. So continuing to put, but the target really needs to be Minister Jordan. She's talking out of both sides of her mouth, saying she listens to local and Indigenous knowledge, then she makes decisions that don't meet it. She says she relies on science and evidence-based decision-making, but her science clearly isn't taking a whole of ecosystem-based management approach and uh, using all the tools you've got, you know, and, um, but she really needs to be the square target of this uh, conversation. And she needs to listen to her committees. The committee suggested that uh, she has a 20 recommendations for the commercial fleet, which could uh, solve a lot of the problems here in terms of reduction and keeping uh, profits in our coastal communities with a, and, and we could easily harvest a lot less if uh, the money was flowing directly to the fishers instead of the, those investors. Thanks, Gord. Um, I see Alex has got her hand up. Yes, I, you know, I, I know it's an uncomfortable thing, but for 34 years, you know, I, I studied sea lice and viruses and participated in every government process. I went to Norway, I spoke to the shareholders. I went to court five times and I never lost and nothing changed until we stood on the bloody farms for 280 days. So there is a place for peaceful, intelligent, direct action. And I mean, I would suggest following these fish. Where do they go after they're caught? Are, are they really going into the fish farms? <laughs> People need to know this. Um, why aren't they being used in a better, more, you know, profitable and also functional way. So I, I don't know what to suggest because it took a lot of thought on my part as to where to place myself. But sometimes if things just won't stop and you are watching ecosystem collapse, you have to figure out where to place your body. And, and you know, don't be violent. This is why I just wrote this book that's coming out on the 23rd because what happened here was so incredible. We knew this was going on for so long and then suddenly it ignited and it stopped. It is stopping. And this summer will be the first return of pink salmon that went to sea with, with substantially fewer farms. And now in the Discovery Islands, the Fraser Sockeye are gonna go through Okasolo Channel with no farms unless these companies win in court but I just, you know, it's something we have to all consider at all times. And I know as a scientist, there's major demerits for being an activist, but yeah, I know I'm active, I'm awake. I can see what is going on. I'm also a grandmother and I've just had it with bad behavior. Yeah. And uh, so I just, I, I, I wanna just support the thought processes that might go into what would, what would be required to stop to make these changes and, and because politicians are caught in this big machine as well. And I thank you, Gord, for everything you have done. I can just see, you know, I read thousands of pages of internal emails to the Freedom of Information Act and I can see the crucible that these politicians are in as well. So um, yeah, it just, it takes everything to, to try to stop this, thanks. Thank you, Alex. Um, I think we're getting to the end of our uh, session here. There is one one more question um, from somebody from Rochelle Chinnery, who is our art show manager. Um, she says, I'm stunned by the idea of an unknown quota owner. Where can I find more information about this? Good question. Um, actually, the report is excellent. And you don't have to read the whole report. There's 20 recommendations. Just Google cherry and risks and benefits, West Coast fishery, fisheries and FOPO, FOPO uh, report on West Coast fisheries, you'll get it. And uh, it's in the report. There's 20 really clear recommendations that make common sense. And one of them is making sure that the public knows uh, who owns the quota. And it, it should just be something that we should all expect, but that's actually not the case right now. A lot of these uh, shareholders and, and quota owners are holding them in, well, they are holding them in private. We don't even know. You know, people are, are in Berlin or in Shanghai uh, or Brisbane owning uh, quota in Canada. 
for a public fishery here. And those profits are leaving our communities. People are out on their boats. And I mean, I had a friend who was out fishing halibut this year and he was paying a 90% lease price to a quota holder. He had 10% to run his boat and crew and pay his bills. He made nothing, of course. I mean, this is how flawed the, the system is and how geared it is for the rich and the well-connected. It shouldn't be like that. And if it was actually geared towards those people on the water, we could fish less and bring our oceans back to a state of abundance or at least measure it from that lens. But right now, this is uh, destroying coastal communities. The profits are leaving our communities. It's completely unacceptable. It's an injustice that's happening and it's costing our ecosystem enormously and it needs to change. So demanding that the government follow through with the report and support our commercial fishers actually by doing that. That's a start because that's one thing we're aligned with, with the commercial fishers. And for those of us that want to see this fishery cut back is, is that this is a part of the solution where we can converge all together. They're united in wanting to see this happen as well. I think Bryony had something to say about this too. Well, I think it's just the elephant in the room. I mean, you can't walk on any dock in the Strait of Georgia this time of year and not hear um, Jimmy Pattison's name. And I, I did go through all the DFO spreadsheets trying to actually get some, some understanding, some data on, on who is owning the boats, operating. There's lots of different lines, but I did mention in, earlier that, um, you know, when, when, uh, representative of Pattison's was, was brought up before uh, parliament, he mentioned that, you know, somewhere around 30% of the quotas held by Jimmy Pattison um, companies. It, it certainly looks like more than that when you're going through those licenses and, and looking at and tracking each company and finding out these numbered companies are actually butterfly companies of Pattison Industries. So in my cursory research, um, I would suggest that, that Pattison is a player, uh, a very significant player, and that the Heltzik uh, blockades of Save on Foods was also a considerable um, factor in them getting their moratorium. And I think we need to do the same. And, and just to clarify, Kat, uh, it's about the beneficial owner of the quota. That's, that's what we don't know, is who the beneficial owners are of the quota. So they might have a numbered company, like Brianne said. Thank you, Brianne. You're doing such awesome work, always, uh, for defending our coast. Um, and, but it's, it's about getting who are the beneficial owners. And uh, this, is, this is absolutely essential that we, we, res we resolve this. And that we are united with the commercial fishers, the people actually who are fishing. But Jimmy Pattison's company, uh, they'll argue that they need this fishery and that the, they'll argue all the benefits to the people out on the water and that it's critical to their boats uh, to harvest the other species. So it's kind of like a burn, a cash burn for this fishery. It's to keep the, fi the boats and the crew going for the more lucrative fisheries. They don't make a lot of money. Some of the smaller boat owners and some of the people who actually own quota they're maybe making some profit, but overall, the bigger corporations, this is about feeding the machine into the more lucrative fisheries. It's absolutely just ridiculous, you know, that we're burning through the ecosystem to uh, sustain uh, some of those vessels for, for more lucrative fisheries uh, and, and, and using, you know, a fish that barely is used for human consumption. Mainly it's being consumed to keep the boats going to get them into lucrative fisheries. It's, it's not sustainable. Thanks so much, Gordon. Thanks to all our panelists. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Grant now. Hey, thanks very much, everybody. It's been an amazing morning now afternoon. Um, so what I'd like to do is, first of all, I'd like to go, go through a little bit about the summary that I've taken away from everything I've heard. And basically, where do we go from here? What are we going to do? What's Conservancy Hornby Island going to take away from the last couple of days? And what are we going to do with it? And, and I, there's one thing keeps going around in my head when I listen to all of you. And that's this one little simple, I don't know where the saying comes from, but it says that if you, 
the definition of insanity is keeping doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, that seems to completely sum up where we sit today. We've gone through, we've had 180,000 people sign petitions that, that went to Ottawa. We've had letters written to the minister. This is the fifth herring fest. We brought scientists, some amazing people to speak on this. Uh, we, we met with DFO every year on this. Uh, we went to the IHHPC, the Integrated Herring Harvesters Planning Committee, and I had my butt carried out on a platter after that meeting, I'll tell you, they were not amused at what we were doing. So where are we gonna go? What are we gonna do? Number one takeaway to me is, Rebecca, can you put uh, Dave, Dave Little's Elliot's book up, please? This is the first thing we have to do. Everybody in British Columbia or on the coast should have a copy and read this book. This is the, I think it's one of the most significant things I've, I've, uh, I've seen and looked at in a lot of how many years I've been doing this. Dave Elliott is, is a Wasanic elder. He died in the eighties, I think. He, uh, he was hired by them to go to the, all the schools in the Sanic area and speak to the school kids. And he, he wrote this book about saltwater people by Dave Elliott. You can get it, you can't quite see it on the bottom of the screen, but it, it's from School District 63 in Saanich. Take that book, get people to read that book. It really, I think, summarizes a, an awful lot of what um, uh, Chief Pelkey was talking about. Number one, I think that's what we have to do. We have to listen to, to these people, traditional ecological knowledge, all the stuff Dana was talking about, Brian, the history, those, that's the basis of real, of our ecosystem-based management. And Excuse me, Grant, just, just so people know, um, Brett, Peter Bradley has posted a link to where you can purchase that book in the chat if you wanna go there. Oh, that's great, okay. So Rebecca, you could um, take the, okay, that's great, thank you. So there's another book out there which, which uh, was written by uh, a woman who lived up in Alert Bay called, uh, it's called The Pleasure of the Crown. That's another amazing book that summarizes this whole, what Bryony talked about, the settlers moving in and, and how the arrogance of them assuming there was nobody here and if they were, they were savages anyway. And you know, you think that doesn't exist in our culture today? No, I don't think so. It sure does. And we have to start listening and learning and take on a different approach to these things. I think that's what everybody was saying today. We obviously need better science. Gord was just talking about what we call the herring recovery program. We, the government puts money into all kinds of things. They've had buyback programs before. We, a hundred million dollar program that will help First Nations rebuild the stocks. It could buy back licenses. It could ensure, like Gord says, which is obviously need to do what licenses there are there should be held by fishermen. By We should help the fishermen and any fishers that are gonna be displaced by this to get retrained, help communities that are gonna to come to difficult times on it. We need to, uh, and I think, Gord, I think somebody said the same thing. We need to encourage industry. And I don't mean the Jimmy Patterson industry. Industry go from a, what it is now from a very high volume, low value fishery to what one that's based on human needs and how we can go to a high value, low volume fishery and employ probably more people ultimately than we do now. Those and, the, and that independent science issue that John and Robert talk about, we up, that, that should be part of this program. I think that's something we are gonna go out and support. All these things we've done over the last five years, we still haven't really changed DFO's mind one bit. You know, they go back to that science. They go back, I've read that book now, that, that book that comes out every year, the, the draft management plan. I read it now five times and it's the same words every year with a couple of different numbers changed in it. Talks about precautionary principles, ecosystem. The science, we need better science, independent science. And we, it, so civil disobedience is something we have to do. We've got to do what Alex was talking about. We've got to get out there. We, we've got to go to save on foods and, and do that. The other thing we need to do, which is what we're going to start doing tomorrow, except the weather's going to be lousy as a gale boy, but 
Next week, we're going to go out and take people out on the old Sun Corona there, and we're going to go out and see the absolutely amazing event that goes on around Hornby every year. We're so fortunate to still have it going on. We're going to go out and see all the creatures that are out there. That water is going to turn a milky white again, and it's going to be truly amazing. So we want to celebrate. We want to feel good about what's left around us, or we'll just feel we're not going to do if you get we're not going to get bogged down and not want to do anything. We're going to start planning Herring Fest 2022, at least thinking about it. So if anybody's got any ideas about what the focus should be next year, please let us know. So again, I want to thank you all. You make this whole thing work. It's been an amazing couple of days. And um, so just to wrap up here now, um, again, you know, as Chief Pelkey said, something else we want to do, I think maybe we should look at setting up a trust fund that people can donate to, that the money could go towards supporting First Nations in doing the, that protest, in, in going to court. It's incredibly, as Alex knows so well, and Chief Ernest, it's incredibly expensive to go to the Supreme Court of Canada to challenge this stuff. It's at least a million dollars. How are we going to get that money? to do that kind of stuff. We need to support the First Nations that are willing to take that cause on. And I think we should do that. You can help us as well. Little Conservancy Hornby Island, we're gonna keep pushing this issue. Uh, we hope you can, uh, people will continue, we'll go to the art show. It's on until March the 31st uh, to the Herring Campaign. We hope you'll go and uh, to Dana's um, website. It's uh, pacificherring.org. We hope you'll go there and, and learn more about what she's doing. The Herring School website. Did I get that right, Dana, there? Good. Um, we hope you'll do that. You can go to Facebook and, and see uh, the Casey and Finnegan film. You can see, uh, you can go there now anytime and get it. And for folks that want to stay on, there's going to be three short films going right now. The, the Herring Protectors. Uh, there's followed by Casey and Finnegan again and Bob Turner's amazing little, uh, the herring fishery last year. So thank you all. Kath, did we cover it? When this Ryan, is he's trying over, to show us something there. Come on to Hornby Island. We'll take you out on the old boat and see what's going on around here. Thank you very much. Oh, Friday. Nice. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.